now if you look at Desperate Housewives or whatever, reality TV, it's the same stuff over and over again. And what we're facing is trauma. Black community and white community. And what I would say is black folks are experiencing a post-traumatic slave uh, uh, disorder, stress disorder. And I would say that white folks are dealing with a post-oppressor stress disorder. And that's one that we don't talk about hardly at all. What, was, what is the trauma of white people for living in uh, a nation that many times when it comes to rap, to race, is batshit crazy? <laughs> all right. You know, I think I'm going to go to the last one. Um, thank you for being here. I want to pick up on the trauma piece. Um, I'm a psychologist, and that's something as black psychologists, as there are different organizations that talk a lot about trauma. We now know from scientific data, there's been studies that have looked at, if you look at the experiences of people who um, are of the ethnic Jewish background, we know that there are now studies that they're saying that trauma has an effect over generations. Um, we know that, I think, as an artifact, I think, in terms of anecdotally, that trauma is, in fact, very real and can pass down through generations, but we now have scientific data. And so I want to pick up on that because the emotional trauma of being a person who identifies as black, but who has that experience, is very real. I want to add into there the other layers, of course, of gender and class and intersectionality because those are very real when we're talking about, I can't just answer the question about race because I do present as an African-American woman and that's always, I'm not black here and then a woman here and that's very real. So my experience and other women of color's experience is not just through race, it's through that gender. So the last play that we saw was so very real. We were over here clapping and you know, clapping out loud, clapping within because I think every woman of color, every black woman I know has similar experiences. And they don't make the news. And there's something that we have to deal with. So when we're talking about trauma, when we're talking about the experiences of women of color, we have to understand they are rooted in fact of us being viewed as property. We can thank the 1705 slave codes of my home state of Virginia, right? For defining whiteness, for saying that in fact, if you are not a Christian, if, if, you're, you're, if you're not from an area where Christian was practiced, you were seen as someone who could be enslaved. We know that as in fact it was a law and it was perpetuated throughout this country in the foundation of slavery. And if we understand, if you look at the civil rights movement, what people don't talk about is that a lot of times there were black men standing up for the rape of black women and who were being lynched for it. So when we talk about the history of race and that intersection of gender and class and all the other isms that we can think of, we have to understand that it's rooted in trauma and we have things in black psychology which we call emotional, emotional emancipation circles where people need to take time and heal and understand and name it and call it and work together and create change that way. But we have to recognize that we're all dealing with this trauma, and it's not just one group or another. One person's trauma isn't more than, than another's, but that they're all unique in different ways, and the only way we're gonna heal as a country is to recognize that trauma, but also recognize who the perpetuators, the, perpetu um, the perpetrators of the actual trauma, and to hold that accountable. So every, everywhere in the developing world, you've got populations that are labeled as black and populations that are labeled as not black. Black people on the bottom. Everywhere. Doesn't matter what type of economy it has. Doesn't matter how the state is run. Everywhere. But here's the thing. If you focus on that in the United States, at every point in time, You've got black people at the bottom of every, every social indicator you can, you can imagine. But if you track it over time, there's variance. Right? There's, there's times when black, for example, black life chances increase, or times when black uh, average incomes increase, or black education levels increase, uh, times when it drops off. Right? If you look at it cross section, that is, you stop tracking it across time, right? you look at it across space, Baltimore, to Gross Point, to 
St. Louis to El Segundo, you see that there are some places where black people do better and some places where black people do worse. Right? Now, that now, if we understand white supremacy as being something that exists the same way in all spaces and across all times, what we lose is the ability to understand what produces that variance, right? We lose the ability to talk about that. Right? So as we can talk about how race is kind of a technology that renders some populations human and some populations less than human, uh, a technology that makes it common sense that some humans get stuff and some humans don't, right? We have to, we have to maintain that sense, we have to wrestle with that variance. Because for me, as a political scientist, right, what I tend to think about is the role of political institutions, of law, and of a range of political actors in actually increasing and decreasing variance. In as much as what the folks at center stage are trying to do is to prod us not to think, not just to think, but to a certain extent act, we have to keep that in mind. Because what we're talking about when we're talking about institutional change, is not just about dealing with people's psyche, not just about, for example, making police see us. We're talking about changing institutions. So I'll just leave you with a Ferguson example, and then I'll, I'll pass the mic back. Um, Ferguson uh, is in a place where 21% of their municipal revenue comes from policing its citizens. 21%. It's the second highest revenue generator of, um, yeah, in Ferguson. It's policing. Now, if you've got a dynamic where the police basically are policing black folk to make money for the city, then it, it doesn't quite matter whether they like black people or not, whether they've been trained in sensitivity training or not. None of that stuff matters. What matters is they need to get that loot. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to be consistently going back to variance, to politics, and the institutions. Because while I like the, these plays and what's happening here is really powerful, there's a way to use art that gets at some aspects of race and how it functions, but really ignores that institutional stuff. So, yeah, the question for all of us here picked up on this. I mean, if you understand, I think, on the as we are not about the death of racism in our world, it does to every institution, every one of us. So if we accept that, and then we have to figure out how to deal with it institutionally, and where do we go? So we're in the 21st century. The 21st century. And this century began with Katrina. And then Barack Obama happened. And then Video sort of happening across the country of police brutalizing black people across America. And it pushed the envelope further. And reaction came back in waves. And Donald Trump has three quarters of the Republican Party saying he should be president. So there is, see what people might argue, a them and us. Scary way to think about it. A them and us. We're in the 21st century. Where do we go? How does it change? What are we building here? Segregation ended, but integrating into what? So what do we change? How do we get there? Who has some thoughts on that? Some ideas. Maybe the audience members too, and how? Who wants to grab this first? Where do we go? What do we do again, sir?
some of the more white ring friends of his through his rhetoric of, of you know, stepping into the thing, you know, drop the in bomb, anything like that. So that doesn't have to happen. I think it behooves everybody who's white in this country to do what he does, which is not let any of that stuff go by. Ever. Not once, not for a second. How do we change this country? Where do we go? I think everyone needs to own a privilege. So I think white people need to own a privilege. I think men need to own a privilege. I think able-bodied people need to own a privilege. I think um, people who are heterosexual need to own their privilege. We need to own our privilege. I think it is problematic to ask someone who's been raped to figure out how to change the world. I think it's problematic to ask people who've been traumatized to figure out how to change the world. And I agree, it's about institutions. Um, as someone in the work that I do with, it's with communities, but it's institutions that play a role. But, and institutions are made of people. And it's that thinking, changing our thinking. But just making it into something that we can all come together and agree upon a new system, a new way, and a new approach to doing things. But I think it's, I think fundamentally what I will go back to is that we all need to own our privilege and do something about it. And not to sit back and say, oh, someone else will say that or someone else will correct them, but to do something about it. I think that's our first step. So there's this, uh, this African symbol uh, and a deeper symbol called the Sankofa bird, very familiar with it. Um, in the Khan language, it means the word Sankofa is not taboo to go back and fetch what it is that you forgot. And I think that there's some lessons and some questions that need to be asked of the past. We talk about the new civil rights, but what happened, what were the failures of the first movement? So when integration hits, and I talk to my elders all the time, I'm a cracker kid, I'm 32 years old. So I do not know of a healed black community. But my mother does. She's in her late 60s. And when I talk to them, they talk about a black community that was um, diverse socioeconomically. Where you, a working class person or a poor person or someone on social services, you have a house next to a doctor or next to a teacher. And that black community was very different than the one that I grew up in. And we were taught how to dodge bullets at the age of five years old because of gang wars. Um, after integration, so we fight and we fight and we fight for a place at the table and we get integration. So then busing happens and that starts to um, move different people from neighborhoods, right? Now they're going to different schools and then folks redlining ends and the black affluent folks get to leave the neighborhood. And my question as someone who's 32 years old is why did you leave the neighborhood? What was it that we were missing? as a moral imperative that we needed to stay a collective, that there was power in our unity and in our community. And what I would say is, is that we weren't asking the right questions. We should, we were wanting the American dream, but we, sh we should have asked, is the American dream actually something to want? <laughs> this individualism, this materialism, is that something, or maybe what we want is the South African idea of Ubuntu. I am because we are. Maybe if we adopted that as a people, we would have succumbed to the American dream, which I would say for black folks tends to be a nightmare. And I would say for white folks too. So that's one question that I'm asking myself as we move forward, that we need to be fighting this is something, so I'm, I'm an ordained minister from the book of Nehemiah. The walls of the city of Jerusalem were broken to pieces, and he, Nehemiah, commanded um, everyone to build and fight. We must build institutions. I was really upset when I saw what happened at um, Missouri with the school, and I was also excited because I was so happy to see student movement in you know, but I'll tell you something. I really, being someone who went to Tuskegee University, I was like, I wish they just went to a black college because our black colleges are dying. So we'll fight, for, we'll fight to sit at tables and not build our own table. 
and a lot of the other racial, ethnic, cultural groups in America build their own tables, and they end up way better than us. Carter G. Woodson said something I thought that was very, very uh, powerful about 100 years ago. He said that black people are taught through the education system to learn about British authors and Latin and Hebrews and all this other stuff. And people from foreigners, language like used, foreigners, they come to America, and while we're studying Europeans, they're studying us. And they know exactly what to sell to us in our communities. They know exactly what to do. We saw that in the play with Mr. Chen, right? There's a lot of tension between, and I know they said he was, uh, what was he, Cam Cambodian, or, right? But we know in our community, in my community, other than what's Baltimore, they're Korean, right? There's a ton of tension. But one of the issues is, is not that the Koreans are building our community, but is that we have swallowed this black inferiority complex where we don't even want to build in our communities. We don't want to spend money at black businesses. We don't, and so to me, for black folks, we need to, to ask some serious questions about ourselves because this has been going on for 500, 600 years. I don't know if racial injustice structurally or systemically or in the institutions of America will ever change. I don't know. But I do know that we can rise as a people. So it's funny, when, uh, when Kwame asked me to do this, I've, uh, I've met Kwame once, we just in the same space. So I get an email from him, and my Gmail is like 96% full. I didn't even know you could do that. So I get an email, and I just click it, and I'm thinking, I'm thinking it's like a, it's, I'm thinking Kwame is, I'm thinking somebody from the center stage is asking for loot, and I'm broke, right? But, I, but for some reason, I look at this, and it says, hey, Lester, it's like a form, hey, Lester, and I'm like, then I realized it really was to me, right? It really was to me. It's like, damn, I didn't even know you were doing So when I said, once I, 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 I got here, I said, oh, okay, I'm going to do this. I had to decide what role that I wanted to do, right? Because I'm a teacher, that's what I do. So this is the role I'm going to play. I'm going to be the loving critic, right? I'm going to be a loving critic, and I'm going to tell you what the loving critic looks like. And if I'm not being sufficiently loving, I want y'all to tell me, for real, right? Okay. So we need white brothers and sisters to raise kids that are anti-racist. Racism is in the fall. But here's the challenge. Thinking about that institutional dynamic again, right? It's not that difficult to imagine a circumstance in which whites raise anti-racist kids who are for real, for real anti-racist, while they still live in redline neighborhoods where they tend to not always, but they tend to get more stuff, right? So that's maybe necessary, but it's not sufficient, right? So what you're doing is wonderful, but what we have to do is think beyond the individual, which gets back to the which gets to the tri privilege concept, right? So yeah, I think it would be absolutely wonderful if men took more advantage, took more responsibility for the privileges they had. But cities like Detroit have tens of thousands of white kids that have gone untested because the cities don't have line items to test them. Privilege is, is maybe important, but it's not sufficient, right? That, that's that individualized component, right? That we have to kind of really dig down and talk about what politics is. Finally, black people love black people. Black people's problem is not inferiority complex. Black people's problem is the lack of material, right? And that struggle, what we have to do consistently in black communities, is acknowledge a couple of things. One is that as taxpayers, right, I lived in, I lived in Missouri, right? Those black kids who go to Missouri pay taxes to go to Missouri. Missouri is theirs, right? Those kids, I teach 
teaching Hopkins, one of the things I have to tell kids all the time, black Latino kids, is like, I like this university is yours. You pay your money, right? So there's a challenge in articulating this concept that it, it takes us towards a problematic kind of conservative politics if we are focusing on black spaces as if those spaces aren't structured up and down by political institutions and economic decisions that affect all of us but hurt us disproportionately. You know what I mean? So, at the same time, I want to pick up the thing that just came up here and get your ideas. Uh, Mike Paul tweeted in, a reforming institutions that reinforce the fact of segregation seems critical. How? Which in some ways is like a follow up, just push this further. So, what, I want to give the audience here for a moment. What do you do, what, how do you begin to change it? I got back, when I was in Cuba, one of the great Cuban scholars said to me, Afro-Cuban man said, in Cuba we've been dealing with institutional racism in a very deep way over the last six years, a long way to go. But individually, racism is still all over the planet in Cuba, even though it's most a black nation, almost everybody in Cuba has some black blood. So it's a complex question. So, how do we unravel here in the United States? How do you think we unravel? Where do we start? What happens? Don't give a thought. I know you want to ask him. Sure. Pass that back. Hi. Um, so I just moved to Baltimore about a month ago from Louisiana uh, and trying to learn more about the city. This is helpful. Um, but in Louisiana for the last six years, I worked in state government um, at an executive level. And I think one of the things that um, I thought about every day when I went to work and my colleagues, um, not all of them, but some of them thought about every day when they went to work was what institutional changes do we have to make from the inside and wake up every day to focus on from how we structure income taxes to how do we design um, institutional programs that support people um, in a meaningful way, and how do we provide supports that are really meaningful and supportive of families. Um, but that requires waking up every day and doing that and getting involved in government, showing up and voting, going to work for the government even when you disagree with them. I was probably um, very politically um, uh, apart from my employers in Louisiana, but they, you know, sometimes it helps to be the voice of, um, I don't want to say the voice of reason, but I'll, I'll go with, the, the voice who is, is saying the opposite. When everybody else at the table in the courtroom in, in government is saying, you know, we need to eliminate this program, we need to restructure um, and, you know, impose drug testing, things like that, on people who receive benefits. We have to show up and want to be a part of government so we can change it from the inside. Um, and that takes all of us. I, I agree with the speaker um, and what you said. I'm an ex-federal employee. I've worked at different layers in government and nonprofits, etc. And I agree, and I go back to um, what my colleague here was talking about. I think it is an institutional issue, but I've seen it done, that people use their privilege to create situations, to, get, to cut through the red tape. And so I think it's not an either or situation, it's that they all have places and spaces in which they operate. And when you recognize that, I've seen things get done because people recognize there was a need to get done. Um, the fact that we have so many black women, you heard about you know, Officer Holt's call in that case that happened recently, but nobody heard about it. How come the media as an institution didn't talk about that last year? I knew it, my students knew it, and my students have been exhibiting a lot of agency and voice if you pay attention locally um, in the news. And so what I think is important is that we recognize that it's, you know, I think privilege and intersectional, these have become these terms that people say, the talking heads say. Um, but I think when people understand that when you're dealing with these issues in writing policy 
and creating programs at each level in government, that it fundamentally comes down to who is the decision maker and what are the reasons for them making one decision or another. And that's what we need to do, is to have a critical mass of people who understand how to create change that way and how to exert um, some type of agency for themselves and, and exhibiting that voice and putting that to use. And I think that's part of what needs to happen. So, so, let me say, so, so I'm thinking what you just said, and if you think about in this country, some of the polls and studies have said that there are about 30% of white people in America who think that racism is a problem, and it's a big problem in our country, about 30%, right? That's the poll, 25 percent That's a minority of that majority. And so that does beg the question in terms of what we said, what you, I mean, what you said earlier, that's true. Right. If you said, you jump up my head, somebody said, that, that, that it's, this is not an issue. It's not just, this is not a problem that black people have to solve. Yeah, that was me. You said, <laughs> you, it's not a problem that black people have to solve. It's a problem that the rest of society has to solve. And that's the only place it changes. So that is a huge, huge question here. How do you get there? And how we get us there. We, we get us there. I'm talking about me. White boy here. White folks. How do we get it there? How do we get it there? I'm going to come right back to you with you. So it's a kind of follow-up question. I'm going to tell a short story first. So I have a girlfriend who's white who's dating a black man. And she and I were having a conversation, and in the conversation she said, I've begun to feel uncomfortable because, you know, most white women who date black men, they only date black men, and that's not me. And I actually have black female friends, and most white women who date black men don't have black female friends. And I grew up in this community, and I'm an advocate, and I'm a teacher, and all these things, and I want to tell these women um, when they're looking at me and my partner that I'm not one of those women. And I shared with her, I was like, well, then you understand the black experience because that's what we share, the struggle of I'm not who you think I am. And most, I'm just gonna say white, but others who aren't black or others, um, this place of privilege is more so asking someone to share in that struggle and that's what's difficult. It's even the conversation of moving neighborhoods, if you can afford to live in a better neighborhood, a bigger house, how do you ask someone to make the choice to not do that? How do you ask someone to make the choice to be judged or to have less things? Um, I, I guess I was thinking about this for a while while I was watching the play, is that I have been thinking about this a lot over the past year of that I think confronting masculinity is completely intertwined with confronting racism. Because um, I, I was watching this and over the course of the first four plays where we saw pairs of men talking to each other. Um, and as a theater artist myself and as a woman in theater, constantly in that conversation of where are the visible women in theater where their stories being told. Um, so I do think that that confronting masculinity in all of its forms, not just having to do with men and women, but masculinity in sexuality and masculinity uh, in feminism, uh, in which it divides uh, feminists from each other, where in which there's a lot of racism and feminism, and I think that also has to do with masculinity. Um, so I do think that masculinity, uh, confronting questions about that within lots of different communities is a conversation that no one wants to have. Um, and I, I, but I do think that it, it has to come to the forefront about, I, I, I've been reading a lot, I guess I always have my students read the revolutionary hope conversation between Audrey Lord and James Baldwin, where Audrey Lord just, she just keeps, she won't let it go. And a couple of my students were dissecting that uh, in one of my arts classes at GTUB, and they were differentiating Audrey Lord from James Baldwin and saying that Audrey Lord was being really aggressive and that James Baldwin was winning the argument because he wasn't being aggressive and she was being really aggressive. And so that really spoke to me is that like, this is really the root 
I think it's this masculinity, the way it's, the, what it has become in America is intricately tied to everything that we've been talking about. Um, and I, I don't know, I, I'm gonna start rambling this so I'm gonna stop talking about it. Um, but I do think that it's really important. To talk about the idea of structural institutional racism and how do we shift those things. Again, looking into the past, what can you look right now? What got the attention of Baltimore City? It wasn't Penny North, I can tell you that much. Because Penny North looked worse pre riot than it does now. That's weird. So what was it? It was Camden Yard. It was downtown because it messed with this city's money. Dr. Martin King did what in my government? He messed with those folks' money. That was a year-long boycott. Why is it that gun owners, Jewish folks, and I believe also LGBTQ community have lobbies, but black folks don't? We have one trillion dollar spending power, and there is no black pack to move politicians to do something, because campaigns are paid for. People think it's votes. It's not votes, it's money. And we have money. This is, the, I think, one of the issues that I have when it comes to without the money being brought into it, and without the use of money, the use of politics, and the use of strategy to move these things aggressively, is this. If I don't talk about money, and how we can collect them, I'm just talking about black folks, when I say black folks' money, we're super black, I mean, you need white folks' money, right, to, be, to put with black folks' money to actually make that thing strong. But here's the thing, if we don't talk about that, then I'm talking about the altruistic nature of white folks. Their benevolence, that they will be morally good enough to let go of power. And when you're in a system that's made even when we come to men, why do men want to give up power? Because we have power. And I can use what? I can use my power for influence and money. And if I believe the American dream, I'm getting it. So why would I give that up? So there's a few motivating factors. Now me as somebody who's spiritual, I would love if that was the motivating factor. Was love? Was peace? Was this? But this is not how things work in the world. It's fear. We see that with Trump right now. This, this xenophobia, no, you fear motivates, right? And money motivates. You want to get everybody in the room, you want rac racial peace and love, just put a whole bunch of money in the middle of the room. Everybody will be friends, kissing each other, love, uh, you know, we'll get everybody to be bipartisan with you. And that's because our country's God is money. It is, it's, we worship it. When you start to deal with the God, the idol, when you start to speak to it, the people will shift. And I feel like if there was a black pack, which can be created, to talk and to campaign for black issues, what Democratic nominee right now is running on it, is running on it, is, is, is even attempting to run Black Lives Matter type talk conversation, Bernie Sanders. He's the only one that's even attempting to move in that circle. Why isn't it on every single candidate, Republican and Democrat, why isn't it on everybody's campaign trail? Because of what we just saw. We just saw every, the whole country get turned up. They never saw this in the 60s. All of the entire, we had people up in like Oregon raiding Trader Joe's. It was nuts what we saw this past year. Why isn't it on everybody's ticket? Because we're not bringing finances to the table saying, Here's our trillion dollars. This is what we'll back. And if you don't line up with these things, we're not going to give you support. And we got a swing vote. So we'll swing this election whichever way we want. As long as we're in the Democrats' pocket and we're not in our own building something, we're not going to have a place at the table to be able to shift politically the, uh, the conversation in a way where we can eradicate racial injustice from the struggle. Um, I think about 10 minutes left. We see a lady go up at this at 4 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 4 o'clock, Sunday night. Is this Sunday night? This Sunday night. <laughs> I lose track. Um, so I, I do want to kind of want to get one on where we are taking this conversation and where, where we can take it. That we need to talk about altruism. We need to talk about altruism. We need to talk about altruism. Not worth a lot of those conversations, and it's that it's it's, it's a struggle.
struggle with this. A political struggle is pushing the envelope, constantly pushing the envelope. But pushing it, where are we going? And I, and I think that that's, that's the point. We'll come back to the question of what we do and what, what we can say to our society now. Because we're going to be, I think, like for a long period of time, over these next, whatever those years are, 10, 50 years, of, this is going to be part of the forefront and crucial mass of what America is going to be about where it's going, is race. And the depth of racism, as I put it. If the Levy Boy said the problem of the 21st century is going to be race, I'm causing this problem that the problem of the 21st century is us understanding that the bottom of depth of racism in our society, the depth of it, and where that takes us, and how we fight that, and how we change that. <coughs> Dr. Spence? Got the mic. <laughs> <laughs> what are you trying to say? <laughs> I'm not going to say anything about you. Know, um, so one of the blessings of, of living in a city like Baltimore is I think it's small enough to matter, but it's kind of big enough to win. Um, a second blessing about living in, uh, living in Baltimore is that to a certain extent, because it's a predominantly, <clears throat> it's a predominantly black city, that, we, that that idea of being the minority, we don't really have to wrestle with when we think about Baltimore. And that allows us to have certain conversations. Right? And in fact, it's interesting because if you think about it one, of it, one of the good things about that for whites is whites can actually learn to live in a city where they're not the majority. And that actually can have certain types of effects. But bringing it back to what we're here for as far as the what can radical theater do in a moment like this to keep the moment we have open wider. So instead of talking about what we can do broadly, what can radical theater do? And then what can radical theater do in Baltimore? So we've got cases now, right? The, the, the case with the first uh, police officer. Yeah, just about to wrap up. What if people had plays in different sections of the city every time one of these cases came up to actually try and try the case? Right? To actually radical, to get people to think about government, about the role of government. Right? What, what would that look like? Right? What would it look like if we created a space where black people, because black interests are different, like black, black people have different interests from one another. What if we created the sites where black people in neighborhoods like Sandtown, Winchester, could routinely talk about their political interests and think about what that might look like? What we're talking about, we because if we scale it up too big, if we talk about change in the United States, you're going to lose everybody, right? Because nobody, you know, one of the things Tallahassee culture is trying to uh, point to, uh, culture trying to make in that book is change, changing a, a damn city, a country. It's very difficult for a single person to do. But if we talk, talk instead about Baltimore, right? If we talk instead about institutions like Center State. Right? Like the Center for Emerging Media, what can they do? Then we can have another conversation because otherwise what we're going to end up talking about is, is individual level change because people's heads just can't wrestle with anything above that. And because we're not talking about the relationship between institutions and political and economic power within a space, it just ends up being you know, I want to. I want to make sure that I'm not calling people niggers. I'm sorry. Use my white accent. I'm not calling people niggers. <laughs> so I think it's time now. I mean, let me ask you, Tamia, if you would take us home with this. Oh. All right. <laughs> um, I agree with my colleague here. I also want to add. Um, you know, we have a, there's a history of art within every social movement. If you look um, in the early 1900s and the civil rights movement, I mean, even in other places in the world, there is a history of art creating social change. And I'm personally passionate about that. So one, just kudos to Center Stage for doing this because yes. this was an amazing experience. And as someone who was an English major in college, I loved the narrative. And I think the personal narrative 
particularly me in the women's studies department, personal narrative is what's needed as we're talking about healing communities. I think it's personal stories. Um, it's what's needed for people to find some kind of relationship and then you juxtapose that and using metaphors in different settings. I think that's brilliant. And I would love to see that being portrayed in different ways. I think we have a moment here um, when you look at Black Lives Matter and what they've done and with Black like Twitter. Um, when you talk about agency, especially women of color, and I go back to the boys, love the boys, and race is an issue. But that was a man saying race is an issue. And I think that in itself is just so problematic. I think race is an issue. But for me, it's more than race. And for a lot of people who aren't males, it's more than race. And I think that's important to recognize these intersections that the founders of Black Lives Matter, that they they are women who represent different sexual identities. And that gets missed. When we talk about the struggle, I think it's something that we're all connected in different ways. And that Twitter and social media has, has served as an opportunity for some people who have been silenced to have a voice. People have issues with that type of activism, but I think it's very real, it's here, and we should recognize that. So when I think about um, just what I've experienced today as um, someone who loves the arts and as someone who teaches to, to students, and this was a welcome break from grading in the semester, <laughs> um, what I do want to say is that I'm very hopeful. When I have a student email me and say that she used to believe in reverse racism, and now I'm taking my class, she no longer does. For students, start to understand that hopefully they'll go off and create good policy. Um, and that maybe in 100 years we will have dismantled some of these structured pieces, but that we have a lot of people working together um, individually and collectively to create institutional as well as relational change. So, thank you.